Okay, hello and welcome to today's webcast, Dynamics GP, AP Automation, and the Archimedes Principle. We are glad to be joined today by our presenter, BC Krishna. He is the CEO and founder of Business Payment Solutions Provider, Mineral Tree. As we get started, I would like to remind you that we invite you to ask questions using the Q&A block that you will see uh, on the right side of the screen. And uh, without further delay, please let me turn things over to BC Krishna. BC, are you there? Jason, I am indeed here and waiting for you to turn it over to me. Okay, oh, you should have control now. All right. I'm I great, thanks. And I love control. Um, <laughs> it's the <laughs> who wouldn't, right? Uh, but I appreciate, uh, you know, uh, uh, you uh, setting this up for us, and welcome everybody to uh, uh, to this uh, little discussion we're hope hopefully going to have over the next sort of hour or so on uh, Microsoft Dynamics GT, uh, accounts payable automation, and how all of this harkens back to um, you know Archimedes, um, you know, in the medieval times. Um, I wanted to reinforce what Jason said that if you have questions, please ask them along the way. You can type them into your WebEx panel. I'll monitor it, and um, and then um, you know we'll try to get to those questions right away. The goal is, of course, to have this be as interactive as possible. I'm also joined here by my colleague Brian Allard. Brian is a product manager here at Mineral Tree, and uh, you know over the course of the uh, the next hour or so, Brian, I'm sure we'll jump in, or I might put you on the spot, Brian, to answer or ask questions. Of course, I'm looking forward to it. What was the highest degree that Archivity has achieved? <laughs> okay, we don't know that either. I don't think they had the SAT in those days. All right, so um, <clears throat> let's um, let's dive right in. Um, in terms of an agenda, um, I want to just really, you know, take you <laughs> into, uh, you know, a little bit of Archimedes' background. We don't know which school he went to, but he was a very cool person. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, about business payments and some facts about business payments that may surprise you. We're going to spend a little bit of time sorting out the alphabet soup that is business payments, uh, Great Plains, Accounts Payable Automation, GL, ACH. Let's get our acronyms and definitions in order so that we can have a good conversation about this. And then, you know, obviously we're going to try to present some revelations and take us back to our committees that allow us to really think about business payments uh, this time uh, achieving a great effect while keeping our clothes on, unlike our committees who jumped out of the bathtub naked uh, when he made an important discovery. I spent a few minutes doing a demo to show you how some of these revelations might uh, present themselves in practice. And of course, you know, if you have Q&A now, later, after the fact, you want to make a phone call and, you know, <laughs> engage deeply in more Q&A, we'll be happy to do that too. So, you know, this is Archimedes. Um, you know, he's giving us the evil eye, but he was a very cool person. Apparently, he dressed well, uh, had a phenomenal beard that would made the, make the 2013 Red Sox very envious. And he was a polymath, a uh, very multi-talented person, did more things before breakfast than most of us, or at least I would do in a lifetime. And he had many famous quotes and many famous discoveries. But the one that I think we want to focus on here is his, um, you know, uh, statement about leverage. <laughs> it's a statement that speaks to physical phenomena, but also forever um, memorialized the term leverage in the business world. And that's really what I think we're going to spend some time on. Give me a place to stand, and with a lever, I will move the world. I think uh, we have here uh, a place to stand that's Great Plains. I think we can create more leverage with the Great Plains investments that you've made, and we're going to spend some time talking about how um, that Great Plains leverage uh, can be achieved in an area that uh, typically has not gotten a lot of leverage, and that's in accounts payable. So that's the question that Archimedes would ask us today if he was sitting among us and listening to this webinar. Are your investments in Great Plains Dynamics, uh, uh, Microsoft Dynamics GP, providing you the greatest leverage in AP? So to answer that question, what I'd really like to do is to start with um, uh, the opportunities, right? I mean, you can think about um, where the leverage might, you might ask the question where the leverage comes from, but it's an open-ended question. And the open-ended question can be, uh, I think, answered better 
with looking at some facts about business payments. Now, some of these facts may surprise you, um, or they may not. Um, as practitioners, as seasoned practitioners, you might find that, ah, uh, ho-hum, this is sort of not really that big a deal. But I think what we're trying to do is to put some data and some numbers behind these facts to provide a larger context and in some ways a breathtaking uh, uh, amount of spend that is made by businesses on AP. You know, every few years, the Federal Reserve Bank does a payment survey. It's the Federal Reserve Bank Payment Survey. Um, if you Google the web, you can find this. It's in the public domain. And uh, the, they, they did a survey in the year 2000. They did a, I'm sorry, they did a year survey in the year 2005. They did a survey in the year 2010. And they've just completed a survey, and they're about to release that. Um, I've not incorporated the analysis of the most recent survey, but, you know, what they do is they try to um, look at the, the trends in the different types of payment vehicles, you know, check, ACH, wire, and so on, credit card, debit card, that businesses, consumers, and others um, use. It's a very comprehensive, very broad, really interesting survey. And uh, they put together a document, a presentation, they go on a road show, they tell the world um, you know, what, what things are actionable and not. And one of the things that uh, they did in that last survey was to, was to put a PowerPoint presentation together in which they presented this data. And the headline says, check payments are declining. That's sort of, you know, I've, I've appropriated that headline <laughs> and I've added to it. Uh, and you can see that the broad trends in this data are Pretty interesting, right? Of course, check payments are declining. They're down in consumer to business by 35%. In uh, consumer to consumer, they're down 56%. And but the but there's a there's a there's a very nasty thing that the Fed did in putting this slide together, where um, particularly in the box that says B to B. Uh, the overall box trends, the kind of stacked bar chart shows that there's an overall reduction in, in check payments. But the B2B checks, you can see that they've inverted this slide, inverted the bar. It's actually going up by 53%. It's gone up from 3.9 billion checks being issued by businesses to other businesses to 6 billion checks being issued by businesses to other businesses. That, those checks are what they call remittance checks. So these are, as you all know, these are checks that are written to other vendors that have remittance detail associated with them. You know, it's sort of really a stark uh, data point for two reasons, because it is the only area in this entire payment trend which is uh, increasing, where everywhere else checks are decreasing. That's one point. And the second point is the degree to which the number of checks have grown is starkly amazing. To go from 3.9 billion to 6 billion is a very, very significant growth. If you combine B2B checks, that is business checks that are written by businesses to other businesses, with checks that are written by businesses to other consumers, that is um, whether it's a um, you know an employee expense or a, a vendor that masquerades as a consumer, uh, the total number of checks that are written by businesses, B2B and B2C, is a staggering 11.2 billion and growing. So that's you. That's us, the folks on the, in, the, in the business community that use Great Plains and NetSuite and so on. You all know this. If you were to do an analysis, for the most part, what you're doing is writing checks. 80, 90 percent of your payments are going out by paper checks. So what's interesting is what we know anecdotally and maybe not dwell on is um, uh, in the, taken in the aggregate and presented through the lens of a credible agency like the Federal Reserve Bank shows you how staggeringly large this number is. So what I wanted to do then is to take that and try to cast it into cost. What does it cost us? What does it cost us at a macro level? Again, a very busy chart, but Please allow me to take you through this. Um, for starters, what I've tried to do is to just really not only include the business checks, but also include consumer checks because, you know, as people, I think we might be intellectually interested in what it costs us to issue checks. 
So when you issue a check, uh, of course, there's the cost of issuing a check and there's the cost of depositing a check. By the way, there's a small little data point I'd like to share with you, which most people are not aware of. Federal, the, uh, our law, the U.S. payments law requires that a check be paper. In other words, if it's not a pay piece of paper at some point in time, it's not legally a check. It's not legal tender. It's a little artifact of, of, of our payment system, but that's just what it is. What that results in is that there's uh, a check that has to be created, con converted to paper at some point, in other words, and that piece of paper needs to be deposited. So there's about 20-odd billion checks, 27 billion checks that are issued every year, about 30 billion checks that are then de deposited. The reason why that number is higher is because some of these checks are deposited for forward clearing. In theory, the same number of checks are deposited as the number of checks that are written, but there's a few extra checks that are written that way. But what does it cost to issue a check? You know, and let's kind of really focus on stamp, envelope, check stock, ink, maybe a little bit of labor, uh, maybe some bank fees, uh, you know, and but let's exclude, you know, things that are a little bit more difficult to calculate, such as fraud, such as the U.S. Postal Service subsidies, uh, and so on, right? I mean, there are many, many studies that show that the check issuance cost, that is the hard cost of issuing a check, is between a buck fifty and three dollars. In fact, uh, the federal uh, government, uh, when they switched over from, um, you know, uh, providing income tax refunds and social security payments, uh, until very recently they were all check based. And uh, they did a study to understand what it would cost to go from check to ACH. And uh, the, the analysis showed that for a for a uh, entity as large as the U.S. government, with the scale and the volume that it had, it cost them about a buck twenty to issue a check and about ten cents in ACH. For most of us who are who don't have the scale of the Federal Reserve Bank, um, those costs are a little higher. And you know that's really how you get to the buck fifty to three dollars. So. Let's add them up, right? Um, you know, if you were to look at the overall number, all checks, that is consumers included, that's about $168 billion being spent every year. It is a staggering number. I mean, any which way you look at it, that is what we spend um, in check stock, ink, envelope, stamp, labor, driving around, uh, bank fees in order to create and deposit checks. But if you were to just ignore all of the consumer checks and just really only focus on business checks, that is about $26 billion being spent by businesses to do that. That's $26 billion that is not being put to more progressive use. At the end of the day, let's not forget that you know writing a check is not necessarily a great investment in anything that furthers your business. It's a, an investment in getting a payment instrument out from payer to payee. That's where we are. That's the universe today. And, uh, and as, you, as you saw earlier, that's a universe that's not shrinking. That's a universe that's growing and not growing in small amounts. It's growing in fairly dramatic amounts. So you ask the question, why do businesses still write paper checks? And I think that this is sort of fairly unique to businesses, uh, not to consumers. First of all, they're easy. Right? You go into GP, um, you create a batch, you print a bunch of checks, and they're done. What, is there, what else is there to do? Um, second, it's ubiquitous. In other words, unlike other payment instruments, and I'll spend a minute, you know, a few seconds sort of talking about that in more detail, such as ACH and so on, you really don't need to know anything about the payee, minimally other than their name, uh, but if you want to mail a check to them, you'll also need to know their address, which is fairly easy to get. And it doesn't represent any kind of complicated sort of information that you need to store and manage. So checks are ubiquitous. A somewhat arcane and very important reason why checks are so common is because the, it really is the only payment instrument that we have in the United States today that solves the problem of sending remittance detail to vendors and payees. That is end-to-end. -end. So when I print a check, business check, as you know, usually the remittance detail is associated with the check. When I mail it, the recipient receives it. It makes it easier for them to reconcile the payment that they've received. If you were to look at ACH as an example, um, 
it's complicated. I mean, you know, you can indeed uh, take this remittance detail and put it into the addendum record of an ACH payment, but, you know, what about the recipient? Do they have the ability to unpack that? Uh, and if you are not going to do that, you have to then sort of do some additional work to get the remittance detail over to the payee, often by email and so on, and have to manage that whole process. So for a number of reasons, you know, checks are indeed, um, you know, fairly easy to use, expensive for sure, but solve many problems. But where we are today is that the alternatives are often impractical, and that's what, the other reason why checks are so common. Okay. <laughs> If, that's, if checks are so great, you, know, you might be like Bill Kilgore. I hope everybody has seen Apocalypse Now many hundreds of times, the greatest movie ever made. Uh, and, um, you know, I hope you all remember that great scene where, uh, you know, uh, Bill Kilgore uh, basically says, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Uh, now, there's something romantic about paper, and there's something romantic about the smell of paper, and there's certainly something... Um, you know, to be said uh, uh, about, uh, you know, some of us may even like the sweet smell of, you know, check stocks pulling out from our laser printers every day or every week or whenever you do a check run. But, but the point is that, you know, it's still a, um, a fairly, um, you know, retrograde regressive instrument um, because it has lots of problems. It's inconvenient to issue because you have to print and mail them. You have to, it's inconvenient to deposit. It's slow and costly. They're prone to fraud. There are many people that claim that the cost of fraud from checks ranges from about a billion dollars to about $15 billion annually. Those are numbers that are very difficult to validate, but that's just what it is. The perceived float advantages, which sometimes um, you know, people talk about, are mostly mythical, uh, you know, especially in the sort of low interest rate environment that we all live in. Um, you know, it's more of a hassle not to know when somebody is going to cash your check uh, and potentially deal with achievement issues. Than, um, than this business about, oh, yeah, you know, uh, I've got float. And the other side of it is, look, I mean, the businesses that you all are part of, I'm not, I mean, if you have to depend upon check float to run your business, I think that, you know, uh, you've got bigger problems. Um, and so, and, and the, other, the main point, I guess, is that at just about every trend, um, you know, industry, industry, whether it's sort of because in the, in the payments industry or regulatory um, is against paper checks. And so I think there's a sort of a, a huge um, opportunity to really, um, uh, you know, um, uh, look at this problem and, and make it simpler and easier for us to understand. Um, let's see, Jason, um, I see that somebody has a question. I'm not really sure how to ask them to answer it. Uh, maybe you can, you can help me. Or maybe you can... Yeah, I was actually... I just saw that, too. And if uh, if you've raised your hand, uh, feel free to... And you have a question. Uh, feel free to enter it in the Q&A block in the sort of lower right of the panel here, and we'd be happy to, to get that. I can also reach out. But, uh, but, but BC, for, I don't see any other questions in the queue yet. Okay, great. All right, so I think I've sort of beaten this to death, right? So paper checks lots of, have lots of problems, and hope you all... You know, I, the reason why I wanted to beat it to death is because we don't wake up in the morning saying, I've got a paper check problem, and I need to address it. I don't, right? Most businesses just really go about their merry way saying, this is the way I've done it. It works. But I think it's useful to really bear down and understand the social as well as business cost of doing it, and more importantly, the potential cost of staying in the past as the world is, you know, moving ahead. Now, that said, you know, you have to ask the question, what's the alternative? What are the alternatives to paper checks? And today what we have is um, a situation where uh, in the United States we have five payment rails. Um, ACH is one many of you are familiar with, the use of debit cards and credit cards to make payments, and, of course, wires. Those are the, that's the universe of payments that we have available to us. The problem is that the alternatives to paper checks are often difficult to incorporate into a business payments workflow. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with ACH the most, and I'll start with that. Um, as you all know, GP has an EFT module uh, that allows you to create ACH payments out of GP. And in theory, um, you know, uh, you might say, well, that's it. I can solve my problem. All I need to do is to sort of incorporate the EFT module, and that's that. 
But that sort of still leaves many, many issues open. It is a good step towards to the, to the end state, but you know, uh, files have to be uploaded. You, you create the file, you still have to log into the bank, you still have to upload the file. There's all these questions about what that does for your payment approval process and segregation of duties. Um, the remittance information that I mentioned earlier doesn't solve any of that, right? It's great to create ACH, but how am I going to send the remittance detail to the payee? What happens if I incorporate six invoices into one payment and I want to tell the payee that they're receiving one payment for those invoices? And then finally, of course, you know, banks don't necessarily make it easy for you to use incorporate ACH into your, into your business operations. Uh, for larger companies with a significant payment volume in the more than 1,000 or so per month, uh, banks may be able to, uh, it, it might be a good product, uh, you know, that banks, with the treasury management services folks at the bank will be able to, you know, help you set up. But for the vast majority of businesses that have fewer than that, it can be a very tedious uh, conversation to have. So, and then, you know, the, the problem with debit cards and credit cards um, is, again, you know, we've got two issues. One is that in a B2B setting, it's often the case that very few payees are acceptors. Uh, certainly the larger businesses, the Verizons and the Comcast of the world may accept card payments, but my attorney does not, and he certainly does not want to accept, uh, you know, 0.5 to 2.5% interchange on it. Uh, and then finally, of course, I don't want to be like, you know, getting on the phone, giving my card number to my attorney as part of my AP process. That doesn't scale at all. So the sort of push versus pull element of debit cards and credit cards. And then uh, wires are great, you know, because there are so many good features that wires have, but, you know, nobody's going to pay $20 for payment to send and then $30 to, to receive that payment as well. So those are all the challenges that we have with the existing sort of forms of payment. So, you know, it's all fun and great to talk about how checks are, um, are a problem. And, uh, you know, but I want to make it worse even. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is the tail end of a payment process, right? The issuance of a payment is the end result of an AP process. It doesn't start and end with writing a check. It starts much further upstream. And this is where I want to make sure that we get our definitions all correct and our worldview all properly set up. You know, what we're really dealing with is a an accounts payable process. You know, in some ways it's the oldest process in the world and it's not changed very much. Um, you know, you have a vendor or a payee that sends you an invoice for services delivered and the payer now has to process that invoice, make a payment. And that essential everyday process hasn't changed very much. And I want to highlight the fact that in addition to it being paper based, it's also fairly inefficient and it's costly and it's risky. What do, I, what do I mean by that? Uh, what I want to do is to break it down into its constituent parts. And you know, we try to think of um, accounts payable um, as sort of invoice processing and payment in particular as consisting of four things. One is you receive an invoice and you capture that invoice. So in other words, you record the invoice and its details into an ERP system. The second is Invoice approval. Now, again, the first step and the second step, by the way, um, I'm presenting this for simplicity as a serial process, and it is. But some, in some cases, as you know, businesses will get receive approvals for the invoices prior to the uh, recording of those invoices into the RP, into the GP. Anyway, so you have invoice capture as a first step, which uh, and then the uh, second step is invoice approval. Is it okay to pay? I might need to route the invoice to a department within the company in order to say, can I pay it? The third step is I age it. Once I receive an approval, I say, okay, is it, you know, can who should I pay? I've got a budget that I want to fulfill today. So what does that mean? I have, you know, X thousand dollars to spend, X hundred thousand dollars to spend. Uh, which ones of my vendors am I going to pay? How much am I going to pay? Am I going to short pay them? Uh, and so on. Am I going to use credits? Things like that. Um, I might need to use payment control, such as segregation of duties, dual authority. Uh, and so on. Those are sort of payment approval processes that you know you often need to go through. And then finally, when all is said and done, there's a payment execution itself. And that is where you get into, great, I know who to pay, how much to pay. I've gotten all of the approvals that are necessary. Now I still need to print a check. I need to create an ACH file. I need to send the remittance detail out to the payee. That's sort of a, you know, what I mean by saying let's get our context set and our definitions right 
that is the AP process. I hope you agree with us and me, but by and large what we find is that that AP process tends to be manual, ad hoc, and paper-based for most businesses. Now for very, very small businesses, micro businesses that have less than 50 payments, it might not matter. If you are Home Depot or the Mayo Clinic and you have several hundred thousand payments per month, invoices per month, your pain is so intense that you probably have automated a lot of this stuff. But most GP uh, users that we know of are not on those two extremes. And uh, we still find that a lot of them sort of, you know, really running manual ad hoc paper-based processes. So what's a person to do? This gap between uh, GP, your bank, your internal stakeholders, and your external vendors is what I'll call the AP chasm. There's a gap between, uh, you know, some of these entities, and herein lies inefficiency, security risk, uh, control weaknesses. The invoice capture process, approval process, payment approval, and payment execution, I think is where by, uh, by uh, you know, providing, looking at those, um, bridging the gap between those different stakeholders and systems, uh, there's an opportunity to further leverage your investments in processes and in GP and, uh, you know, to make life better for you. So I think it's useful also at a very high level, I wanted to sort of share with you some industry data on costs, uh, you know, and cost savings before and after, if you will, right? So again, this is data that many of you may know about, are familiar with. There's data that uh, we have not created, but we, we look at some of the data that's out there. And the question is, how many invoices and payments do you process per month? What is the cost of doing it in the current manual way? And what is the cost of doing it with automation? So, you know, there are lag, people, <laughs> people who have done the studies call them leaders and laggards. Um, you know, the laggards uh, that run manual processes tend to look and issue a lot of paper checks tend to find that the cost per item is about about $10. And those that are leaders that have done some kind of automation will find that those costs in people, processes, material costs, fraud, inefficiencies, are able to drive that down to less than $4 per item. Many of you um, may be wondering and thinking, well, you know, gosh, I only have 25 payments a month, 50 payments per month, 100 payments per month, and how is this going to affect me? And I think, you know, of course, this has to line up with the cost of solutions themselves. That comes later. But the point I want to make is that even at a very, very modest volume of 100 to 200 payments per month, the annual savings can be quite significant. Now, what are you going to do with $7,200 in annual savings? Well, you know, you might say that's a drop in the bucket. It's not worth, not worth my while. But, but also, just as importantly, what it is is a cleanup of process and uh, getting on to a train that's more progressive than a train that's more regressive. Uh, of course, you know, the greater the volume of invoices and payments, the greater the benefit and perhaps the greater the urgency. But that hopefully gives you a framework on what the benefits are for, you know, for automating some of these solutions. So, well, again, you know, Archimedes would be cheering at this point um, if he knew that we were talking about this stuff. And um, indeed, you know, um, if he knew how we were doing it today, he might run screaming from the room saying, I can't believe you do this. And indeed, we would all be shocked by his nakedness. Um, but the point is uh, that, you know, we can do better. This is the 21st century. It's not the era of Archimedes. And, uh, you know, what we feel is um, we, can, we can do better. Um, um, what I want to do at this point is to, there are, uh, let me back up, right? There are many ways to do better. Um, you know, certainly my goal, our goal here at Mineral Tree is to show you what Mineral Tree can do to help you make this better. And indeed, those of you that, that might be allergic to a, a pitch uh, might be turned off, but we try to, like, you know, keep this as objective as possible. And even if you don't end up, you know, expressing a greater interest in what it is that we do, we hope that you see this as an example of what's possible if you were to bear down and look at this particular issue. So treat this less as a product pitch and treat it more as an example of what's possible. You may well, you know, uh, get off the webinar and say like, that sounds great, I'm gonna go build it myself. 
Uh, I hope not. Uh, but you know, if you do decide uh, to take this further, we hope you will talk to us. Um, so anyway, so what I wanted to do was uh, give you a 30-second overview into what Mineralty does uh, in addressing these issues and then turn it over to Brian, uh, who will then uh, walk us through a live demo of our solution to actually give you a real live experience into what that means. Um, so uh, what Mineralty does is it sits between your um, GP instance and your bank, and it does four things. When you receive an invoice, it allows you to um, scan the invoice, uh, route the invoice for approval, and associate the uh, hard, uh, convert the hard copy documents into electronic documents and associate the documents with the invoices that are entered into GP. Second, um, once you route it and have the approvals ready, uh, it provides a set of capabilities to enable you to uh, follow payment controls and payment approval processes. When you make the payments, we execute the payments and then uh, send it on directly to the, uh, to the vendor or to the bank uh, for clearing. All of that is done in the context of a, um, a very secure framework. Uh, we believe very strongly in trying to put our money where our mouth is. And uh, you know what Mineral Tree does is it says, despite using Mineral Tree, if you lose money to online account takeover, we cover customers to the tune of $100,000 per year. So in other words, it's both simple as well as secure and fits into the context of your existing ERP and bank systems. So that's kind of what um, I wanted to take you through, and let me um, turn it over to Jason. Maybe if you can make Brian the presenter, we'll walk you through a demo. Okay, I am making Brian the presenter now. Great, and you should be able to see my screen at this point. Um, we do. Hopefully everybody is looking at an interface that's very familiar to you. Uh, this is the transaction entry portion of the purchasing module within MS Dynamics GP. And what I'm going to do is walk you through kind of those four key phases that BC discussed um, that Mineral Tree helps you automate. So that includes the invoice capture, the invoice approval, the payment approval, and on to the payment execution. So starting off in GP, we'll be focusing on first the invoice capture. So I've gone ahead and pre-entered the information for this invoice. I'll go ahead and I'll post this. Now, at the core of the Mineral Tree product is a real-time bisynchronous connection between MS Dynamics GP and Mineral Tree. As you can see here, we're connected. You have that indication along with this little like Mineral Tree icon Not over sure. here. Not sure. Uh, is it lagging? Oh no, never mind. Here. Okay. So now that we've gone ahead and entered our transaction into GP, we'll turn over and take a look at the Mineral Tree product. So Mineral Tree consists of two primary applications, an accounting manager application as well as an approver application. This first application that you can see is the accounting manager application. Now this is where the majority of the pre-work will be done um, to kind of get invoices approved and submit those for payment as part of a payment batch. You can see in this column titled approval, there are a number of different colored bubbles. What these are doing is providing the status of the invoice. So I'll walk you through what it looks like to approve an invoice within Mineral Tree. Stepping back and talking about the process that exists typically with paper, what this is a corollary to is taking a printed invoice and placing it on, let's say, the VP of Marketing's desk saying, hey, did you receive these services from a PR firm? Typically, they'll sign their name and then maybe add some coding, letting the AP person know um, how to apply that invoice within GP. What we've done is we've taken and we've brought it into Mineral Tree in an automated fashion. So rather than printing off an invoice or forwarding an email, you simply enter the approver name, you can add any message that you'd like, and then attach documentation. So documentation is really simple to put into the Mineral Tree solution. It can be done by simply forwarding an email, it can be done by uploading directly from a desktop, or we also provide a software that allows you to 
scan those invoices in, separated by a blank sheet of paper, um, during which time we run a process called optical character recognition, making them fully searchable. So we'll go ahead and we'll send this approval out. Now what's happening is we're automatically generating an email to the invoice approver on file. In this case, Brian Allard, I've given myself a promotion to VP of Marketing. And I'm receiving an email in my inbox. I can view any attached documentation and then act on the invoice. So I've approved this invoice, meaning it's ready to pay. Once invoices are ready to pay, it's on to the payment approval process, which is the next step in a typical workflow. So these green bubbles have all received their appropriate approvals. We'll go ahead and we'll add these to our queue. So as you see me clicking on the pay button, what I'm doing is I'm building my payment batch here over on the right. I can pre or I can set future date selections for anything that I'd like to here. So let's say I want to release this at some point in the future. I can very simply do that. And once I've made all of my modifications here, I go ahead and I submit my payment batch. Now, the, one of the nice things of the Mineral Tree solution is that it's a sole source for all payment types. So that includes check and ACH. And when we get to the approver application, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Let's go ahead and submit these. Okay. Now that I've submitted my payment batch to the approver, I'll log out and I'll put on my CFO hat. So as I mentioned earlier, the Mineral Tree product consists of two primary applications, the AM and the approver. The approver application, which I'm logging into now, is typically provided to senior people within an organization. Now that could be a CFO, that could be a controller, in some cases that could be the CEO. Basically, whomever is responsible for approving a payment. Previously, this would very often consist of simply signing a name on a check. Um, sometimes that would require one person, sometimes more. So now that we've logged into the approver application, we can go ahead and look at what it looks like to approve payments. Now, if I'm not too diligent of a CEO, I could simply approve from the list view. However, in many cases, I'll want to review the supporting documentation as well as any approvals that have been requested. So as you can see, all of the relevant information is provided. Any documentation that's been attached will follow the payment throughout its life cycle. Go ahead and approve this one too. And in some cases, there may not be any documentation or I may not see what I want to in order to approve the payment, so then I can still take a few actions. In this case, I'll reject the payment, sending it back to the AM application. No backup provided. Now, once I've acted on all of the payments that I'd like to, I can go ahead and submit my payment batch. Now, we do offer multiple approvals in case you have, you know, for instance, two people signing off on a check for values above a certain amount. All of that is configurable to provide a mechanism to accommodate, you know, whatever workflow that you have there. So now that we've submitted that batch, what Mineral Tree is going to do are two things. Um, for payments that are electronic, we'll create a NACHA file delivering it directly to your bank. No interaction on your part. You don't need to upload anything. We take care of all of that for you. And we're also going to print and fulfill your checks. So that means we provide the check stock, we affix the postage, and we mail those out. You never need to sign another check. You never need to print another check. You never need to send one on your own. We affix the signatures appropriately and send the check out for there. At the same time, we're also posting back a payment batch into GP that you can apply to your invoices automatically. And at the highest level, that's the Mineral Tree solution. Well, if Archimedes was here, he would say, foul. You said that you're not going to do checks, and now you're still doing checks. What's the story, Brian? <laughs> uh, 
um, and you know the point is that um, you know the, what we're trying to do is to reduce the cost of doing those checks first and foremost, while at the same time providing an infrastructure to allow you to move from checks to something else. We're fully cognizant of the fact that the conversion from check to a non-check form of payment is not going to happen overnight. And rather than take on wholesale change in your environment, what we wanted to do is to provide an infrastructure to allow you to make that change in a more gradual fashion. That said, you know, we're not, you know, at least not, the intent of today was not to talk about like costs and such like, but to really sort of, you know, share with you the overall, um, you know, um, uh, um, the overall sort of, you know, the way in which the process works. So that's the, you know, that's the overview. Um, we're, uh, uh, let me flip back to this screen. Um, and, uh, you know, um, um, we have some time left over. Um, you know, thank you, Brian, for doing that. Um, the point I wanted to make is that all of this is just really, really simple to do. Um, you know, uh, if I can sort of, you know, just say one or two more points about our product and our pitch, it sort of, you know, it takes about a half an hour, 45 minutes to get up and running, and it's just really very, very cost effective. I'll just leave it at that. So that's kind of what we wanted to run through. I know we have some time left, and you know we allotted some time for questions. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, ask away. Um, if you have uh, want to hold your questions for later, that's okay too. So, um, um, so one question that came up here was, what is the well, how much process difference does each? Uh, um, what, what are the different processes in each organization, right? So how different is it from organization to organization? Our experience is that uh, this AP process is very standard, um, you know, across organizations, particularly in the context of, you know, something like GP. You know, you receive an invoice, you enter it, you route it for approval, you set up your payments, and you make that payment. Our experience is that, you know, it's a fairly standard process. Uh, there are some uh, different people that might take on different roles. Um, and uh, and that's um, you know that can be done as well. Um, another question that uh, we had here was, do approvers have to log in or can they approve from email? In fact, as um, as uh, Brian showed you, the invoice approvers. This is one of the ways in which we've designed the process, designed our product. Invoice approvers actually do not need to uh, be mineral tree users. All they all they get, all they need to know is to click on a link that takes them to a web page where they basically say approve or not. And that's a very fundamental design center that we created in our solution. Another question that has, that's come up here is, what about mobile approval? Uh, can they see and approve from the road? Again, uh, thank you for asking. Sort of, we want to get so much in here, but we have an iPad application uh, for the uh, payment approver. Uh, we're releasing an iPhone application for the payment approver as well. And that's the principle, right? So, you know, a very common thing that we've seen in our customers is that the CFO is on the road, the business owner is on the road. The last thing you want to do is to drag them back into the office in order to sign checks or wait until that happens. Um, so that's sort of a, you know, a fairly important element of how we approach, uh, you know, approval. Um, let's see, some more questions. They're sort of rolling in. Keep them coming. How are the invoices uploaded into the system, somebody asks. Um, well, uh, there are three ways in which the invoices come into the system. Uh, they can be emailed in. There's a special email address that um, you know will be set up for our customers, is set up for our customers. And those that are authorized to use the system can simply forward the invoices into Mineral Tree, and that's how they get into the system. That's one way. They can be uploaded from desktop um, into the system. Uh, that's one of the second way. And the third is that we have a piece of scanning software um, um, and uh, that's, uh, that's the way in which you can do that. Um, how does it connect to GP? Um, that's the other question, right? So what, what does it take for my IT department to get this set up? Well, basically the way it works is that um, uh, the vast majority of our application, as all the pieces that Brian showed you today, um, are browser-based and run in the cloud. Except a small connector, what we call a connector or a plug-in, that runs on the same machine server as your GP instance. And uh, it's a very simple download, install, and run. It takes, again, all of 15 minutes. There's some prep. We want to make sure that your 
IT department of, is aware of what we're doing. They may have some questions and so on, but but for the most part, it's you know once you all understand what it takes, it's um, it's uh, it's um, you know it's a it's sort of install and go. Um, question about Windows phones: <laughs> Do you support Windows phones? You ought to be able to browse to the same website that we showed you in order to do that within Windows phones. Uh, the the reason I mentioned uh, you know iPhone and iPad is because we have a native application that runs on iPhones and iPads. Uh, Windows phones, uh, you can certainly go to it uh, using the browser-based interface. Um, let's see here. Can you pay a vendor who requires remittance stub in paper uh, copy by ACH? Uh, absolutely, you can. Uh, what we do is we can uh, send the remittance stub uh, by email, which they can print out themselves. So what happens in our in our in our uh, environment is that uh, people receive payments, uh, you know, using the mechanism that you've chosen, ch chosen check or ACH, for instance. But in all cases, uh, if you capture the email address of the of the vendor, uh, we can send them the remittance uh, stub via email, which they can then print out. Uh, what if an invoice needs multiple approvers? Uh, well, you know, you can certainly route them to multiple approvers. You can include more than one person. Uh, to uh, to approve that invoice, and you get the status of that approval uh, displayed to you, um, um, you know, in the in the uh, in the in the um, um, in the application. There are a couple of questions that also relate to features that we're adding um, very shortly. Um, you know, is it possible to route mass invoices for approval? Is it possible to auto route for approval based on scheduled data time? Both are things that have come up a lot. Uh, those are two features that you know, have been requested uh, of our solution, and we are, you know, very, very hard at work adding those and several other invoice approval features uh, to our solution, including the ability to, uh, you know, distribute the invoice entry uh, into the field. So, for instance, we work with some customers who have, um, you know, distributed operations. So, for instance, a branch office might receive invoices directly. And we want to support the ability for these those invoices to be entered within the branch and then rather to AP uh, to continue the process. So, uh, what reports are available? Uh, well, uh, there are several reports that um, we can we can show you. Uh, they are they are related to the many m much of your reporting will probably come right out of GP simply because we sync those payments back into GP, uh, so we don't destroy any of those reports. But payment specific reports are things like you know clear transactions that we get from your bank, we have the ability to tell you which payments were made and when, what payments are there, what happened, you know, who are the, there's various types of searches that you can do against vendors and so on. Uh, happy to get into all of that in more detail. If you're interested, you know, please drop us a note and, uh, you know, we can schedule some time to, um, you know, we can schedule some time uh, to uh, to to uh, to show you some more uh, to to demonstrate this in more detail. How you pull up an electronic image of a paid invoice from within GP? It's a good question. Um, I think uh, you know uh, once we synchronize the payment back into GP, uh, the paid invoice will be posted within GP, and you can just pull it up from within GP. Now, what you uh, can what you'll have to do to see more details of the payment itself, because of the way GP functions, is that you'll have to work work that within mineral tree. Ton of questions, thank you so much uh, for asking. I, uh, I think uh, you, know, you probably have many more. As I said, uh, if you wish to uh, continue the conversation, want to learn more about what we can do for your company, we'd be more than happy to set up some time to do this um, you know, more one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, the questions are still coming in. Uh, you know, I, I worry a little bit about like sort of having some of these questions. Um, so somebody says we pay some vendor through online banking. Does the support sub system support that piece? Yes, I think this is the other thing that you know we've tried to do is to make both GP and your bank GP as the system of record as well as your bank as the payer of record. Um, you know, truly be first class citizens of this environment. So what happens when you do make payments through online banking is great. You make those payments through online banking. And uh, we don't get in the way of that, right? Um, so basically, what happens is that um, you know um, uh, we, um, when you do the reconciliation, uh, we provide you a reconciliation report that can go back into your GP uh, instance, and that reconciliation report will have uh, you know a list of all of those people that you paid using online banking. But if the question is, 
do we tie into online banking? Um, what we do is we tie into your bank systems to support payments through your existing deposit account. But we replace bill pay. That's probably the question I think you're asking. We, we really think that bill pay is a decent solution for a small volume of consumer-like payments. But when you get into the types of robust uh, things that you know our customers are looking for integration with Great Plains, remittance detail, and those sorts of things. Uh, you know we definitely are. Uh, we see ourselves as replacing bill pay. I think we're gonna. You know, Jason. I think that uh, we could stay here forever. Um, and you know, we certainly have appreciated the opportunity to speak to to your constituents, your audience. Uh, we certainly had a lot of fun doing this, and we hope that uh, um, you know we hope we hope that uh, uh, you can um, you know if this is of interest to you both in terms of specifics related to mineral tree, but more broadly in terms of like you know industry trends uh, and such like. Uh, we would be delighted to engage with you in that conversation. Please let us know and. Uh, uh, Jason, uh, we're going to, you know, give people uh, some seven or eight minutes of their day back. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to you for any final ceremonies. Okay. Well, thanks to everyone in the audience for uh, so many great questions. And, uh, BC, thanks to you for joining us today. You're welcome. We thanks, will... Brian. Oh. Thank you. And, and Brian as well. Pardon me. Uh, Brian, thanks, too. Uh, we are recording today's session. We'll be following up with ways that you can um, can can follow up on this presentation and, and get in touch with, uh, with BC and Brian and his team as well. So uh, we will end it there. Thanks very much and have a great day. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.